Well, most pastors, I know, collect wedding stories. Uh, Weddings are great opportunities for stories because there's just so much in a wedding that can go sideways. I've been part of weddings where the power went out, that happened at the East Campus, where candles won't light, uh, where the groom fainted one time, where another groom became violently ill right in the middle of the vows, on my shoes, everything. Another one uh, I did a couple summers ago on a beautiful golf course in the summer, and this huge electrical storm is coming. I finished that wedding in nine minutes. I think it's still a Guinness Book of World Records. But perhaps my favorite wedding story happened at my brother's church, and you'll see why it's my favorite in just a minute. Uh, They had built, this is like 15, 18 years ago, they had just finished a brand new $10 million or $15 million church facility, brand new uh, whole campus. The young man being married had just joined their staff as a student ministry pastor, so it's a pretty big deal for their church. And it's a very long story, but the, the family of the bride uh, asked if there could be dancing at the reception because the father of the bride had always dreamed of um, having the first dance with his daughter when she became a bride. He'd even spent years handcrafting, I'm not making this up, handcrafting a parquet dance floor that he wanted to put down in their uh, reception room, their, their kind of a little ballroom or fellowship hall they have in their church. So they were asking, can we have a dance? And, and the church leadership was kind of split. This was the very first wedding in the new facility. They'd never allowed dancing in a church wedding before. So they had a conversation about it. Some thought it was inappropriate. Some thought it would be fine. So they finally settled on a compromise. The compromise was that dancing would be allowed at this wedding, but it would be ballroom-style dancing. Day of the wedding came. Ceremony is beautiful, very worshipful. My wife and I went. Several other people went from church because the guy was from around here. And my brother's really good at weddings. He's just, he just gifted at doing weddings. Beautiful wedding. Reception starts, and the first dance is announced, and all the guests ooh and ah at the beauty of the moment. The father and the bride waltz around this handcrafted dance floor. Just very touching and sweet. That dance ended, and then the DJ, responsible for the music, says something like, Okay, now everyone, on your feet and join the party. And the music changed. And the next song that played was a disco tune from the 70s from Casey and the Sunshine Band, Shake, 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 Shake Your Booty. I'm not making this up. Now, some of you just had a bad 70s flashback. I had at least two different staff people ask me, do you really want the picture of Travolta in your sermon? I said, yes, put it up there. Um, People jumped up, and the whole dance floor was just jammed full of young people dancing to shake your booty. I looked at my brother across the table, and it looked like his face was going to fall off. I thought it was awesome because it was at his church, not my church. They toned the music down eventually, but that reception turned out to be one of the most fun, joy-filled receptions I've ever been to. We're in a year-long preaching theme called The Story of Jesus. We're currently in a series called Preparation, The Early Years. And so far, we've looked at the story when Jesus was 12 years old and was left behind at the temple to be in his father's house. Uh, We saw Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. When the the father says, this is my beloved son, we saw the story of Jesus being led out into the wilderness and tempted by Satan himself. And today we find Jesus at a wedding ceremony of all things. Now, again, uh, tonight I'm going to read through the story once, straight through, so you hear the drama of the whole story, and then we'll go through it more slowly. So we're in John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So let me read the story for you. John writes, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. (coughs) Excuse me. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. 
This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, this is a beautiful story. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and even people who know very little about the Bible have heard something about water into wine. They'll use that phrase, water into wine. And by the way, if you're in the book club, you'll be reading this exact story later this coming week. I think it's on Wednesday if you're following right along. So let's dig in now. John says, on the third day, there was a, waning, a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. John begins the story with the phrase, on the third day. Now, Jesus is in Cana of Galilee. I'm going to put a map up here, uh, which I simply want you to see if you can. Um, all the way to the, the north, the top of that map, is a small body of water. That's the Sea of Galilee. Cana and Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, are right up in that region. All the way to the south is the Dead Sea, and close to that area is Jerusalem, and that would be where the Jordan River. So when he says on the third day, he's saying that uh, it took about two days of walking to get from the lower part of this map, the lower part of Israel, all the way up back to Nazareth where he was from. And so Jesus had been down being baptized. There he called a few of the disciples. Jeff will talk about that next week. And then they walked back to the area of Nazareth, and this wedding was in Cana. So on the third day, he's arrived back in that region. That helps, gives you a context. But there's also something else going on here. When I say the phrase, on the third day, does it make you think of anything? Right, okay? Jesus rose again on the third day. See, John is writing his gospel 30 to 40 years after all these events. He's writing them down before he dies. <coughs> Excuse me, something in my throat. And so he's, he's, he knows how the story ends. So he's very intentionally beginning this story so that his audience will know that he's saying something very important about who Jesus is and what he's come to do on the third day, he says. And then we're told that the mother of Jesus was there. Now notice that Joseph, um, the earthly father of Jesus, seems to be out of the picture by this point. We covered that a couple of weeks ago. Most scholars believe that shortly following uh, the story when Jesus was 12, Joseph died, became sick and ill, passed away because he doesn't show up anywhere else in the story and he's not here at this time. But why does John start a Jesus story with Mary? Well, first it's possible that Jesus' family or extended family may have been involved in this wedding. Jesus was from Nazareth. Cana is only about four miles from there or so. So it's possible that extended family, cousins, whatever, are living in that region, and that uh, that's why Mary's involved, maybe even has a role in this wedding. But secondly, we also know Mary had a special relationship with her oldest son. Remember when Luke finished his story in Luke 2 when he says, Mary treasured up, pondered all these things in her heart? Mothers have a special relationship with their children. John says the occasion is a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now before we go on, let me say just a few things about ancient Middle Eastern weddings. Uh, weddings are a big deal in our culture, uh, but they're a much bigger deal in ancient Middle Eastern culture. In our culture, a wedding uh, is basically a, a, a half day or a one evening event for guests. You show up at the wedding, and then if you're invited to the reception, you go there, and then you go to the, the whatever party is afterward, and then you go home. And so kind of a one day or half a day event. In that culture, it was at least a week-long event uh, for a village, and sometimes two weeks long. Imagine a two-week-long wedding reception, and you have an idea what it was like in ancient culture, a festival for the whole village lasting up to two weeks. Then also in, in our culture, uh, the center of a wedding is the bride. The groom just sort of has to show up and not make any mistakes. He has to remember, I do. But the, everything is about the bride, and the bride's family is responsible for the wedding. In that culture, it was just the opposite. The center of a wedding in that culture was the groom. And the bride just had to show up. The center of the wedding was the groom's family. The groom's family was responsible to pay for everything. And they were, they, was, they were highly responsible. Oh, thank you for that. We'll see if that helps. So the groom's family is responsible. Um, and, and not only is the, is, is, is the groom responsible in terms of being the center of the wedding, his father has to pay for all the things. And I, I talked about that a minute ago. So set verse 2 here. Jesus also was invited to the wedding uh, with his disciples. Now, Jesus being invited to the wedding strikes another theme that you might not quite be aware of. From front to back, the Bible 
touches many times on a marriage-slash-wedding theme, beginning all the way back in Genesis with Adam and Eve, when the Bible says, A man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We see it in the Old Testament book of Ruth, when she marries a man named Boaz, and says, Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. In the Song of Songs, one of the least read books in the Bible, it's actually a love poem between groom and bride that represents our relationship with God who covets that relationship with us. We read, Place me like a seal over your heart, for love is as strong as death. The prophet Hosea is told by God to take to himself an unfaithful wife to be able to demonstrate the, the loving kindness and faithfulness of God the Father. Jesus used weddings and wedding feasts as a backdrop for a number of his parables of the kingdom. We'll cover those later in a series as we go through the story of Jesus. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament describes the marriage of a man and a woman in terms of the relationship between Christ and his church. The church itself is called the bride of Christ in the New Testament. Heaven is called the wedding supper of the Lamb. You get a picture? From Genesis to Revelation, the image of a marriage or a wedding is central to the Bible. So John wants us to see that Jesus, the very bridegroom of heaven itself, has been invited to this particular local wedding. Here's a question that just occurred to me as I was reading through things today. Um, if you're married today, have you invited Jesus into your marriage? Just a question. I'm, that's not what the parable, that's not what the story is about, but it's a good question to ask yourself. Verse 3, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now we come to the problem in the story. Every great story has a problem, and here's a problem. They have no wine. Now three things we have to know here. First, the role of hospitality in ancient Semitic culture. Proper hospitality was supremely important in Middle Eastern culture. It was the responsibility of the groom and his family to provide for all their guests, and in this case, probably most of the village. So to run out of wine would have been horribly embarrassing. Imagine uh, hosting a wedding as the, bri as the bride's family today and inviting them to a sit-down wedding. And you invite 100 people, but you only have places for 25. That would be horribly embarrassing. That's what this would have been like in that culture. Second, we have to understand that this is also an honor-based culture. A family's honor was their most important possession. So to run out of wine implied either a careless host who really hadn't planned appropriately, or worse than that, a host who could not afford to adequately care for his guests. And that would be far worse. It would be in great dishonor to his family's name. So Mary is concerned. She obviously knows this family. Maybe she's related to them. She knows they face great dishonor. And so she goes to her son Jesus, who she knows is special in some way, to see if he can help. Third, we need to see, the, 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 and most importantly, the significance of wine in that culture. Throughout the Bible, wine has tremendous significance. It's highly symbolic of the blessing, presence, and joy of Yahweh Jehovah, God himself. In Psalm 104, we read these words. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. Wine played a role in almost every significant religious festival of Israel. Wine was offered as a sacrifice to God in obedience and worship. Wine was a symbol of God's blessing, and there was a rabbinical saying of the time that said, without wine, there is no joy. Now, there's been a great deal of debate through the decades about what kind of wine John is talking about. Now, some have tried to argue that this had to be unfermented grape juice because it's the Bible. These are Bible people. But it, just from the very context of it, it's very difficult to make that argument. It almost certainly was a version of fermented wine but also likely somewhat weak in its alcohol content compared to what we have today. The wine was probably cut two parts wine to three parts water. So while abuse was possible in that day, it was unlikely because drunkenness was seen as a great sin in Israel. So how could this have happened? How do they run out? Well, John doesn't tell us. So don't, we don't really know, but we can make some guesses. Some scholars have guessed that maybe uh, more people showed up 
than they were prepared for. They prepared for 50, more showed up. And there's a, maybe a little hint here because it says Jesus was invited and he also came with his disciples. By that time, he'd called maybe five of his disciples, these fishermen who are following him now. Maybe they weren't prepared for these five men for a week. And maybe that's why they ran out. Maybe that's why Mary goes to Jesus and says, maybe you need to do something about this because your friends are the reason they got into this trouble. We don't really know that for sure. That's just a guess. Verse 4, And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. This is a fascinating little interaction. Now this sounds to us like Jesus is speaking to his mother very harshly. Woman, he says. We would never do that today. At least not if we know what's good for us. You don't talk to your mom that way. But in that culture, that way of addressing one's mother was simply uh, uh, moving into kind of a formal tone. It wasn't rude. It was formal. Like us saying, ma'am. Okay, so Jesus is definitely distancing himself from Mary just a bit by not calling her mother or the more intimate Ima, which would be like mom. Okay, then he says, so he's distancing himself, treating her formally. Then he says, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Now, a couple of things are going on here. First, Jesus is telling his mother that his primary role is not to make sure wedding feasts go right. He's come for a much, much bigger purpose than that. And secondly, he's letting her know that while he loves and respects her, he's marching to a different beat now. He's obedient only to his Father in heaven, not to any earthly concerns. Finally, when he refers to his hour, whenever Jesus talks about his time or his hour, he's referring to his suffering and death. He's saying, it's not time for that yet. It's not time for me to reveal fully who I am and what I've come to do. John continues, verse 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now if this were a movie, uh, having watched so many movies, we would immediately see the camera shift over to these, this row of six stone jars and it would tell us sort of a hint that something really cool is about to happen to these stone jars. John says stone jars specifically because he wants us to see that these were special jars. Now I have a picture up here. A lot of people think this was a version of the stone jars used in the first century. I put this one out here just because it looks cool, but it, this is sort of a clay jar. Most of the clay pots they used then were not appropriate for this kind of washing because only stone jars were used for purification because the stone kept the water more pure and cleaner. So the custom would have been filling these jars with water. Each guest coming to the party would have had to wash their hands and their feet in this ceremonial water that had been purified. Then all the utensils, all the plates would have been specially washed in the water so they were acceptable before God. It was a religious and cultural requirement. Each jar, we're told, holds 20 to 30 gallons of water. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now notice who's Jesus talking to here. He doesn't go to the groom. He doesn't go to the father of the groom. He doesn't go to the master of the ceremony, sort of the mater d, to let them know he's about to save them from great cultural embarrassment. He doesn't. He just gives instructions to the servants, the lowliest people on the totem pole at this party. He tells them to fill the jars with water. Again, nothing special. Not go to that special spring with the really clean cold water and put it in the water. Not go down to 7-Eleven, buy some aqua pura in the bottles and put it in there. No, just get water and fill them up. Don't care where it comes from. From the garden hose. Just fill them up with water. Okay? Remember, these are ceremonial stone jars. These are holy, religious, special purpose jars. And then John adds the detail. They filled them to the brim. Now, most scholars think this is now a total of about 120 to 180 gallons of water in the jars. Verse 8, then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. Now, put yourselves in the servant's shoes just for a moment. Say, what? You want us to do what? To take which water? This the stuff that we just put in these stone jars, the ceremonial jars, the ordinary water we put in the ceremonial jars. You want us to take that to the master of the feast, the guy who hired us, the guy who can fire us? What are you you, what are you trying to do to us here? Makes no sense whatsoever, but John says they do it. Had to sound crazy. Here's what I noticed. Jesus doesn't make a big deal about what he's about to do. He doesn't lift his hands to heaven and cry out to God, his Father, for a miracle. 
He doesn't even pray that we know of. John doesn't tell us he prays at all. He doesn't lay his hands on the, on the jars. He doesn't even touch the jars. He doesn't taste the wine later to make sure he got it right. He just speaks, and it happens. He gives a command, and he does what only he can do. Remember, the miracles we see in the Bible especially the New Testament. When Jesus does a miracle, the miracle is never the point. It always points us to something else. And here's the real miracle that's happening. Jesus is transforming, completely upending their idea of religion and even of God himself. Imagine the servants looking at each other. You do it. <laughs> no way, dude. I'm not going there. You do it. You take the water to that guy. I'm not doing it. Remember, Mary had told them, do whatever he says. Turns out they did. Here's another question for you. Has Jesus ever asked you to do something that on first glance sounded crazy? And if he ever asked you to do something that does sound crazy, what would be your response? So they took it, John says. Verse 9, when the master of the feast tasted the water and now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, so he misplaces the, 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 the credit, and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, the cheap stuff. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now notice again, who sees the miracle first? Who recognizes Jesus first? It's the servants, the lowliest people in the story. The servants, the help. Next, notice both the amount and the quality of wine. This is what John wants us to see. By any measure, in that day, this is an outrageous amount of wine. I got curious, so I did the math. Uh, it says, assuming 180 gallons. I wondered uh, how much, how much wine is in a typical bottle of wine today. And the, the story I looked at said 25 ounces. So I divided it out. turns out to be 921 bottles of wine. And then I wondered about quality. What's the most expensive wine in the world? There's a wine in the Burgundy region of France that sells for $15,000 a bottle. I don't know anything about wine. That's pretty expensive, though. 921 bottles at $15,000. That's close to $15 million of wine Jesus drops on this little party just because he can. Okay? An outrageous amount of wine. Now, the impact of the miracle depends on the fact that it was the best wine. That's why the steward of the feast is shocked when he tastes it. So why this miracle and why now, right at the beginning of the story? Obviously, Jesus is doing more here than making sure a party continues to happen. He's doing more here than making uh, sure a family doesn't suffer embarrassment. He's making a dramatic, unmistakable statement about himself. First, Jesus is replacing ritual religion. He's replacing ritual religion. The master says, you've saved the best for last. Not knowing, he's almost saying exactly what the Apostle Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 1 when he says, long ago at many times in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken by his Son. He saved the best for last. In Jesus, God is providing, providing a new and better way. The ritual cleansing of religion is no longer necessary. Wine represents the presence and blessing of God that will be known now through the cleansing of his own blood shed for the forgiveness of sins, what we celebrated here this evening. Secondly, there is more than enough. There is more than enough. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. Such an extravagant word. Sometimes I think deep down, and I, I get this from countless hours of counseling with people as pastor, and from something in my own heart. Sometimes I think deep down, Many of us wonder if we can really be forgiven. Now we know when we're in church, we say those things, we take the bread and cut, we, we, we say, but we wonder, can I really be forgiven? You know, one of the names of Satan in the Bible is the accuser of the brethren. The accuser. 
What he loves to do is walk up next and say, you know, you call yourself a Christian, but do you really believe he can forgive that? Do you know this memory you have? Do you really believe he can forgive? You remember. I remember. We know. Jesus knows that. And just so we can know for sure, he fills the jars to the brim, to overflowing. Just so we can know for sure, he makes a ridiculous amount of wine, pours out his grace like a waterfall, like a Niagara Falls of wine, like a Niagara Falls of his grace, 180 gallons, there's more than enough. More than enough for you. Thirdly, he's saying Messiah is here. The Savior is now here. Throughout the Old Testament, wine was always associated with the coming of Messiah. In Amos chapter 9, which I'm sure you have not read in recent months, Amos 9, we read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed, and the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. That's a messianic uh, prophecy of when the Messiah comes. The whole story is a dramatic and beautiful picture of the gospel itself. John wants us to know right off the bat, right at the beginning of the story, that Jesus, the one who showed up at this wedding, is the long-awaited promised Messiah, the Savior of his people. In Jesus, there's a new and better way. The wine is his blood poured out for you, for me, and there is more than enough. He wants us to picture, I think, wine pouring from the faucets in our homes. He wants us to picture it coming out of the shower heads of our bathrooms, filling bathtubs and spurting from the sprinklers in our lawn. He wants us to picture the magnificence and generosity of God's grace. A crazy, ridiculous, overflowing abundance of new wine. What he's saying is this. Religion has been replaced by relationship. Religion has been replaced by relationship. Religion based on law and rules has been replaced by relationships forged by grace. Religion that produces duty has been replaced by a relationship that produces joy. And John wraps up the story by saying this, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples. Those five guys he took to the wedding believed in him. A number of years ago, I heard a story told by uh, a speaker named Tony Campolo. Uh, if you've heard him speak, he's an unforgettable speaker and a great storyteller. And he told a story, I'm going to truncate it uh, here today. Uh, he, had he had to travel to Hawaii many years ago uh, to Honolulu to speak at a conference. But due to jet lag, he wakes up the first night at 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning, whatever, and uh, can't sleep anymore. So he goes out of the hotel, looks for somewhere to have a 3 a.m. breakfast. Fi finds the only place open is this dingy little diner. Goes in there, orders a black coffee and a donut. As he's having his black coffee and donut, at 3 in the morning, right at 3 in the morning, or 3.30 or so, the door bursts open, and in walk eight or nine very provocatively dressed women. Within a few seconds, he realizes the diner's now inhabited by women who have been working the streets of Honolulu all night. And so he tries to drink down his coffee. He's trying, planning to leave as quickly as he can because he feels uncomfortable. But right as he gets ready to leave, he overhears a conversation. One of the women, whose name turns out to be Agnes, says, hey, t tomorrow's my birthday. I'll be 39. And one of the other women says, so what do you want, a party or something? You want me to make you a cake? Want me to sing happy birthday to you? It just makes fun of her. And the first woman goes, why do you have to be... Why do you have to get on me like that? All I said was, it's my birthday. I don't want a party. I never had a party in my whole life. So why do I want a party now? Why do you have to be so hard on me? There's a little conversation back and forth. And when Campolo heard that, he got an idea. So he waits around until the women leave. And after they leave, he goes to the cook and he says, hey, um, do those women come in here every night? The cook looks him kind of funny. He goes, yeah, right about 3.30. Why? He goes, well, because that one that was nearest to me, I think her name is Agnes, she said she has a birthday tomorrow. And I got an idea. What do you say we throw a party for her? The guy looks at him really strange now and then goes, okay, I like it. And he hollers to his wife, hey, this guy's got an idea. Let's, let's do a party for Agnes tomorrow night. So they make their plans. The next night, Tony comes back at 2.30 in the morning uh, with balloons, cray paper. Uh, Harry the cook's made a cake. His wife's decorated it. Happy birthday, Agnes. And they decorate the whole place. Uh, Harry's put out the word to the area. And by 3.30 a.m., the place is packed. 
Right at 3.30, Agnes and her friends walk in. And when they walk in, they all scream out, Happy birthday, Agnes! And she almost crumples to the floor. And when they bring out the cake, she begins to weep. And when she gets her wits about her and gets the strength to blow out the candles, they all say, Cut the cake, Agnes! Cut the cake! And this woman says, Do you mind if I don't cut it now? Do you mind if I take it home? He says, well, it's your cake. So she gets up and she leaves. She takes the cake home because she's never had one before. And Tony said, they all sit there looking at each other. She's left. The cake's gone. And nobody knows what to do. So they look at Tony. He goes, what do you say we pray? And he prays for Agnes and her life, that God will bring something good into her life. He'll make a change in her life. He prays for her salvation. When he's done, the cook goes, hey, you didn't tell me you was a preacher. What kind of church you come from? And this is what Ken Folo said. He says, I come from the kind of church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. And here he goes, no, you don't. I ain't no church like that. Because if there was, I'd go to it, he said. See, I think that's what this story is about, the water into wine story. We don't have to try to clean ourselves up to make ourselves presentable through the rituals of religion. We just have to invite Jesus to the wedding. We have to invite Jesus into our marriage. We have to invite Jesus into our homes, into our hearts, into this, his church. And he fills our hearts to the brim. He turns the water into wine. That's the beginning of the gospel. Would you bow with me as I close?